So as you said, we are now coming to our conclusion round where I look forward to your summary and I look forward to also welcome back Mason, the moderator, Mason Davies of the first panel. And actually, hello, there you are. So actually, I wanted to start with you, Mason. Um, so much has been said. Let look, let's look at this, uh, this first panel first. Discrimination against LGBTI persons and political backsliding. Could you tell us, Mason, how was the situation assessed? What was the focus? And what would you say are the main results? So we had a really... Um good conversation about some of the challenges that are happening and some backsliding when it comes to SOGI uh, and protections in the region. Uh, Katrine from Ilga Europe shared uh, some really good information on the conditions LGBT people are currently facing, including a rise in abuse and violence and hate speech. I believe the number she said is that she's seen stagnation or rollbacks in 19 countries, which I think we have to remember that these aren't just rollbacks in rights, these are real people losing real protections and human rights that they need to take care of themselves and their, their families on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and we're seeing more authorities using LGBT people as scapegoats, especially in authoritarian regimes or in uh, governments that are having an anti-democracy movement. Um, and I think it's really important for us to just ask who's benefiting from these attacks against LGBT rights at the moment. Um, why now, given the challenges we face with COVID and other crises? And I heard some speakers mention that LGBT rights did not seem to be the major priority for many of their governments today, given everything going on. And yet we are finding anti-LGBT work is a priority for anti-democracy and anti-rights actors. So we need to understand how do we, how do we defend, defend what we have um, building on the human rights infrastructure and mechanisms that exist. Um, I, I wanted to, there are a lot of examples that we gave because of time, I won't share them. Um, but we, well, several of the panelists noted that there is this very visible anti-gender movement that seems to be gathering strength around the region. Um, and this is part of a larger kind of movement towards uh, efforts to destabilize democracy in some countries. Uh, Bea gave some great examples, unfortunately, in Hungary, where they've been banning gender studies programs. Uh, they banned legal gender recognition for trans people um, and, you know, have had uh, their struggles with the Istanbul Convention because of the use of the word gender. So we know that there's work that we have to do here around this question of whether or not LGBT rights uh, are in harmony or in contradiction to women's rights. Um, and very clearly, all the panelists said, we are stronger together. These are actually rights that are on the same basis of rights, not separate. Um, so I, 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 to one thing they have said uh, was in the panel was to be more combative in protecting democracy. And I think that is the takeaway I would have from the panel, really being aware of this slippery slope in pitching human rights of one group over another. Um, and the more that we can have our institutions emphasizing the interdependent, indivisible nature of human rights with statements and proactive measurements, um, proactive measures uh, to that end would be incredibly helpful. We need to challenge false divisions. Um, the, as, as one of the panelists said, the Istanbul Convention shows that right-wing attacks on LGBT rights also hurt women's rights. Um, we heard that there shouldn't be a conflict between SOGI rights and Christian values. Um, and the LGBT rights are just essential within human rights. So we need to actually put that into action because people right now are being harmed. Um, and we need to be actively monitoring hate groups and limiting their possibility to abuse human rights institutions for their aims um, and really look at where these attacks are coming from. So the, there are a number of concrete examples, funding to groups on the ground, doing research, especially research into attitudes or some of the propaganda that's happening. Uh, the need to evaluate policy mechanisms in all states and to develop uh, those local plans for what is needed for each particular member state and uh, making sure that we have good review and monitoring processes. Um, and, and the last thing I'll leave us with is this question of uh, the importance of alliances for those that are impacted by these backsliding uh, efforts. Um, and so I will um, uh, continue to urge both civil society and uh, our stakeholders throughout the region uh, to be uh, as 
as visible as you can in your support of LGBT rights um, and to let people know that these women's and trans rights need to be thought of together, um, that we will not be divided as issues. And I think that will be very helpful. Um, and, and to actually mention trans issues, I have to say from my TGU perspective, um, because they are very much on the front lines in many of the, the fights that, we're, that we have ahead of us. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mason, for this uh, summary. And uh, the same question goes to you, Josie. Um, the second panel was about strategic goals on a national level. How did the conversation go? What are the main results? And what would be the next steps and concrete actions? Yes, thank you. So we also had a really interesting discussion. It began with a presentation from the OECD on the impact that national action plans have on of fostering LGBTI inclusion. Um, and I encourage everyone to read that report in detail because it is really fascinating, some of the stats that came from it. But essentially, um, con OECD countries that have published and developed national action plans lead to higher levels of uh, legal LGBTI inclusivity and policies that lead to LGBT inclusion and that this is you know a really key and effective strategic measure to ensuring that LGBT rights and LGBT equality can be implemented um, in different countries and what was also interesting to note was that member states are all on a different level on their equality journey in terms of whether they have an action plan or they're developing an action plan or they have neither. Everyone is on a slightly different journey. And so we discussed about what is the Council of Europe's or the European Commission's role in supporting those member states when there is such a variation. And I think we landed on the idea that a tailored approach is required. And, but this relationship works both ways. It's equally important for national governments to submit kind of comprehensive and holistic data when it comes to the monitoring processes and the monitoring reports. So the, the Council of Europe SOGI recommendation is a, is a very concrete example of what is coming up. The more member states engage with that process, the more the Council of Europe will be able to understand and identify what the shared priorities are, shared synergies, shared challenges, and then adjust its capacity building and its programs and its funding to, to meet those needs. So that's really important. And then on a national level, we heard some really fascinating best practice examples from France and from Malta in the development and monitoring of their national action plans. And a couple of themes came out of that as well, this idea of intersectionality. So making sure that national action plans are developed in an intersectional way so that they specifically um, target and have actions relating to LGBTI asylum seekers, disabled LGBTI persons, but also intersectionality when it comes to implementation. I think this is a really important point that Irena from the Council of Europe brought up, which is when when implementing the actual actions in the action plan, working with the whole spectrum of government departments, working with a wide variety of, of stakeholders such as civil society, because everyone needs to be brought on board in order to achieve real progress. So that's really important. And I think it's clear, as I say, that national action plans form a roadmap. They allow governments to be held accountable just because the you know, governments publish an action plan doesn't mean that the work is finished. It arguably means it's the start of the real work and the real progress. And having this action plan provides a really good blueprint and benchmark for achieving that progress. And it also allows for the international organization, so the Council of Europe, to have more detailed understanding of the different, the different levels of, of implementation within um, member states. Thank you so much, Josie, and thank you both for this um, overview of, of two very insightful conversations, as I thought, and many ideas on how to move forward. Thank you both again. And I come now to our last point. Thank you, dear audience, also for staying with us today. So, dear participants, we are now coming 
to the end of this conference, we discussed today intensely how the full recognition of LGBTI rights across Europe could be achieved, what strategic policy measures would be needed to implement the 2010 SOGI recommendation. So wrapping up, it needs to be stressed. While there has been significant progress in many uh, Council of Europe member states since the SOGI recommendation was adopted in 2010, LGBTI, LGBTI equality has not been achieved, by far not. So there is no room for complacency, neither for state actors nor for civil society. Worrisome backlash, a rhetoric of hate, populism, nationalism and state-led persecution in a number of member states remind us that efforts to combat violence and discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation and gender identity must be reaffirmed, continued and strengthened. We all need to remind and to be reminded, human rights are universal and shall apply to all individuals, no matter what. And human rights of LGBTI, LGBTI people must be respected everywhere. So the, to this end, national legislation must be aligned with national and international human rights obligations. This includes inter alia the right to protection from violence, the right to self-determination, the right to marriage and to build a family. And civil society should not let itself be divided, but demonstrate unity instead, especially with regard to LGBTI and women's rights. It's important to work along intersectional lines, supporting campaigns that aim increasing women's rights and the wider rights of the LGBTI communities. So we have learned today that instead of division, we need solidarity. Instead of exclusionary rhetoric and the rise of hate, we need LGBTI plus and feminist women's and other organizations to stand together, to march together and to advocate together. Equality, so concluding, equality means justice and inclusion for all. Dear participants, we are now coming to the end of this event. I want to thank you for your interest and short video clips of this day today will be available soon on the YouTube channel of the Ministry. All participants will be notified via email, the presentations and the keynotes will also be uploaded on the event website and um, you will also be notified on this. And one last note, allow me to um, mention three upcoming events. There is a conference on gender equality and the Istanbul Convention uh, coming up on May 11, organized by the German Federal Ministry together with the Council of Europe. On uh, May 11, as part of this year's European Focal Points Network and an annual conference, um, there's a virtual Idaho Forum to mark the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Inter- and Transphobia. Phobia. And on the 28th of June, there's a digital talk on Christopher Street Day about the corona crisis in the LGBTI community, also organized from the German Federal Ministry for Family Affairs, Senior Citizens, Women and Youth. So, thank you all for your attention. And for more information on how to attend these events, please see our events website. And I thank you again and goodbye. <laughs>